All right, good evening, ladies. In today's video, I want to go through what I think will be one of the biggest breakout niches in crypto in the next bull cycle. And that, of course, is Deepin. And Deepin is Decentralized Physical Infrastructure Networks. Deepin is one of the few use cases and the few sectors in which is already providing a lot of very obvious and easy to see real world value. Like most of the sectors in crypto are 100% based on speculation. They're not really being used as of yet. However, Deepin is already showing and it's very clear to see how it's going to add a lot of value to human society already. And I think there's going to be a number of breakout products in the Deepin space in the next couple of years. And there already has been. So in today's video, we're going to be doing a deep dive analysis onto how exactly Deepin is a better, more efficient way of providing certain services than the current incumbents. And I also want to share my favorite products, my favorite like investment ideas in this sector towards the end of this video. So it's going to be a bit of a longer video, but I think it's going to be very, very interesting and informative for you. So yeah, let's dive straight in. So firstly, what exactly is Deepin? It's a decentralized physical infrastructure network. So what exactly does that mean? I think the best way to describe Deepin is to provide some examples. So one example that is quite easy to understand is Helium. So Helium at the moment has started this new mobile network in the fact that anyone can put up a node or a hotspot, say on their business or on on the roof of their home, anywhere that people are going to be walking by, and they can provide 5G or mobile data networks for people who are in the vicinity. So basically how, what they're essentially doing is completely circumnavigating the enormous capital expenditures it would take to set up the next T-Mobile mobile, in the fact that people can just put a small hotspot somewhere that there's a lot of people going by or there's no hotspots anywhere around in that area, and for doing that, they will be earning tokens. They will be earning these mobile tokens for doing that. And the people who are actually using their data are going to be paying, not directly them, but they are going to be paying the network for using that data. So because you've completely circumnavigated these massive capital expenditures that you would need to like build these enormous cell towers, of course you're going to be able to then provide these services at a much cheaper rate than the incumbents can. And yeah, like right now, if you wanted to start a new mobile network and really compete with T-Mobile, you would need a huge amount of money and you're probably going to lose anyway because the network is so entrenched. However, if you're creating this decentralized network, you actually have a good chance to be able to do it. A good example is the Hive Mapper network. And this is essentially competing with Google Maps. Like if you didn't know, Google Maps makes an absolute fortune for Google. And if you want to compete with that, you have to send out a little car and try and map all these streets like Google Street View. You know, that costs, you have to pay someone to go around and do that. That costs a lot of money. With Hive Mapper, they're essentially just saying, you buy this dash cam, you stick it on your car and if for example if you're an uber driver if you're an uber eats driver if you're a delivery man if you're i don't know a fireman or any sort of any sort of person who drives a lot or you have a long commute you're essentially ma you're basically driving anyway to all these areas so you're going to get paid extra for doing that for helping map these areas and basically anyone who wants to feed into that mapping data or wants to access that mapping data has to buy the tokens to be able to access the mapping data and the people who are mapping the maps are getting paid in those hive mapper tokens called honey as well the third and final example that we'll talk about so you can really get into your mind why dpin really adds a lot of value it makes the product and service cheaper the main reason it's going to be cheaper but it's also going to be faster more performant more efficient and more resilient than the incumbents and the centralized infrastructures that are out there today. But another example is like render or decentralized file storage. So say for example, you're a big gamer and you have these GPUs for your gaming rig, but you only game like maybe two hours at the end of the day or three hours, whatever. And for the rest of the time that you're not gaming, those GPUs are sitting idly. And as we know, GPU power and rendering service are extremely in demand right now like there's not enough supply to meet the demand but all this idle gpu compute power is sitting idly well now instead of just sitting there idly you can actually earn money by 
connect into this network, putting your GPU power, your compute power up for sale essentially for the time you're not using it. And you can earn tokens, for example, with Render for providing that service. And the people on the other end are getting a better rate than going to Amazon Web Services or any other cloud provider. And say you're the customer of that compute power, instead of like trying to set up a contract with AWS, you can just scale up your scale up or down the compute power that you need for that particular task. So I think you're kind of getting an idea of what DPIN is. Like these are some of the advantages and disadvantages to centralized infrastructure as opposed to DPIN. And you know, it's also very much aligned with crypto ethos and with the internet values in the fact that instead of consolidating all this power into Amazon and Google, it's decentralized the power, it's decentralizing the wealth. Instead of having a one or two billionaires in the world, everyone can kind of earn a slice of the pie for providing these services. It's decentralizing power and wealth. I think this value proposition is quite obvious and very easy for a normie to understand. Like normies aren't gonna care about the next perp decks with 50x leverage in some new chain that's slightly more efficient. They're gonna be like, oh, I can make money by doing the drive that I do anyway, or I can make money by providing some storage on my hard drive. <laughs> so it's a lot more, it's a lot easier for them to understand. So with a lot of these deep end projects, like we can see, we talked about the CapEx reduction. You don't have to build out all this enormous amount of capital expenditures, but also your operating expenditures, much, much lower, like these deep end networks don't require a huge amount of OPEX. There's no single point of failure as it's all decentralized. The entire network is decentralized. If one node goes down, that's perfectly fine. There's another 2000 around the world, so that's grand. Some other advantages, for example, uh, decentralized storage networks include that you can have your uh, data stored on that particular network in perpetuity. Like you can have it there forever for as long as the blockchain that you store it on is running. You can also have it so it's completely encrypted. So instead of having data centers where they really have to, you know, make sure that no one ever gets into that data center and robs the data because if you, like if you've ever been to one of those data centers, it's like they're protecting a gold mine. Like the security there is crazy and it's really hard to get into them and you need, you know, to be invited well ahead of time. They you will be escorted around you know, it's taken very, very seriously. Whereas with the centralized storage networks, you can get rid of all this and just encrypt the data and spread it out in shards across all these nodes so that basically no one can access it. And your storage is actually verifiable on the blockchain. You can actually verify that your data is being stored. Whereas with uh, AWS, for example, you're just hoping that they're storing your data, but you know, they are, but you can actually just verify for yourself when it's on a blockchain. So usually how these deep pin networks get going is that they bootstrap the networks by offering massive incentives at the start. So for example, I think when HiveMapper first launched, people who were like the first nodes on HiveMapper bought these uh, hotspots, I think they paid like a few hundred, maybe a couple of thousand for them, but they ended up making six figures because the incentives at the beginning are usually front loaded a lot to really try and build out the network quickly. So there's these massive incentives. That's how they kind of bootstrap the networks at the start. But now to be a, a helium node, it's not very rewarding, especially if it's for the internet of things network, like I talked about in my last video. And right now Hive Mapper, the mapping service, which is just taken off at the moment, the dash cams that you could buy on the website are, I think they're about $400, but it takes like six months to arrive. But if you're, people are buying them on eBay for 2000, because in the time that it would actually arrive from the actual company, you, the person who would be driving is going to make actually way more than that. So it's much more valuable to have them right now. So you might be thinking, okay, but who's gonna be actually be using these mapping services? Well, like I mentioned at the start, Google Maps is actually valued at $10 billion. And for example, one of their customers, Uber, who uses Google Maps, guess how much they pay Google per year? They pay $100 million per year to Google to access their mapping services. So you can imagine if Uber could, you know, you know how much Uber pays their drivers or the, the cut they take from the, the drivers, like 30%, if they could reduce their, <coughs> 
the amount they have to spend on their mapping data, you know, they would definitely look into doing that, in my opinion. And Hive Mapper, so Google Maps is valued at 10 billion. Hive Mapper is currently valued at 50 million. So 120th the size in a circulated market cap. But you might be like, oh, but people don't really want to get involved in crypto. They don't want to have to set up a wallet. Well, most of these data pen projects have completely abstracted away the crypto side for the end user. So you can pay for pay for these services with a credit card. So for mapping data, for decentralized compute or decentralized storage, most of the time you just pay with a credit card and that, mon that money is then taken and converted into those tokens and is either burned or sent to the people providing the services. Like it's a little bit, there's a little bit more going on, but that's roughly how it works with most of these projects. So the crypto element is completely abstracted away for the end user. So. The other nice thing about Deepin is that the revenues that they're earning from these customers is very much, is much less correlated with the crypto cycles. For example, with a, a DEX like Uniswap, the revenue that Uniswap will make is completely dependent on the crypto cycles. Obviously in a bull market, loads of people are using Uniswap, loads of people are using DEXs, loads of people are leverage trading, but in a bear market, all that revenue goes way, way down. However, with uh deep in projects we can already we already have data on this during the bear market the deep in projects revenues only dropped by 57 percent and 19 percent for compute and wireless projects so only 19 percent as opposed to the rest of crypto the revenues dropped a lot lot more so potentially a little bit less downside for some of these deep in projects and that's partly because the end user is paying with a credit card they just want these services anyway so they don't care about the crypto back end they don't care that less people are interested in crypto right now they want the rendering service or the compute power or whatever so they're still going to be paying all throughout the bear market because it's the most cheap, it's the cheapest, it's the most efficient, et cetera, et cetera. Now there is a very strong positive feedback loop that I identified with HiveMapper, but it actually is pretty much relevant to most deep in projects. And, and I came up with this positive feedback loop by myself, but it turns out this is a very well known, very well understood, at least it's confirming what I thought to be true. But basically it says that Say for example, like this is a flywheel, so it doesn't matter really which happens first, but let's say the token price of the Hive Mapper token, which is called Honey, say that the price of that goes up, that means the incentive to create more maps goes up. So people go out in their cars more often and they'll drive to more, uh, less mapped areas where they'll earn more Honey tokens. So they're basically increasing the value of the mapping network. They're making the mapping data better. So then if the mapping data if the mapping data is better, people are willing to spend more to access that mapping data and more customers come in to access that mapping data, which drive up drives up the price of the token. And there's the virtuous flywheel effect. So that's a positive feedback loop, whereas a lot of layer ones, for example, in crypto have negative feedback loops. Like the more people that use Ethereum the more expensive the transaction fees get, which it's a de incentivizes people to use Ethereum, especially like people who don't have $50 to spend on a transaction. So with Deepin, you actually have a very strong positive feedback loop. And Masari, the, a lot of this research is coming from Masari. I'll leave all the resources in the description, but they think it could add 10 trillion to global GDP, which is just completely outrageous over the next 10 years. But yeah, it's, 10 trillion is just completely outrageous really and 100 trillion in the decade after that so might not be that bullish but why not <laughs> now i've obviously been like my last few videos have been about deep end projects or about ai projects and if you don't think ai is going to go absolutely berserk in the next couple of years ai mixed with crypto like you can't be helped look at the nvidia stock price over the last couple of years, it's just been in a complete straight line to the moon. And right now, no one's really paying that much attention to crypto. And even AI is taking a little bit of a, a backseat, but that's not going to last. So crypto and AI are going to go absolutely insane. And a lot of AI and deep in projects are somewhat overlapped. For example, a lot of AI projects will need a lot of file storage and will need a lot of computing power. So and here's some examples of AI with, mixed with deep in, some fun examples, WeatherX 
and Frodo bots. Frodo bots is essentially training these little bots that will deliver food. So basically training them by people playing video game where they're racing these bots. So these bots learn how to drive and navigate and eventually they'll be able to deliver packages or food by themselves. And then the weather X, people can add weather data to the network and from that it's being fed to an AI that is going to be able to help predict the weather in the future. So what are some concerns in regards to deep in projects? Well, a few of the deep in projects, the tokenomics are not great. And like, for example, Hive Mapper, Helium, it, it, there's not a huge amount of utility to the token. Like obviously the token is burned when people use the network, but just as much of the token is is minted to pay out people providing the services. So there's not a huge incentive there's not a huge amount of utility from the token. Like there's no governance, there's no staking and stuff like that. As well, a lot of the people using decentralized file storage, for example, are other crypto projects. Like there hasn't been a huge influx of people yet in into these like a huge amount of companies not in the crypto space coming in and using deep deep in projects just yet. However, I think this will change in the next couple of years. And sometimes these web two companies don't really care about having cheaper prices like their maybe their data costs are only one percent of their overall cost so saving 20 percent on one percent is just not a big deal to them and they're just going to go with the easiest product that they're already using or where they don't have to get involved in crypto whatsoever but i've retained i've done a few videos on dpin at the moment and still my pr favorite project in the dpin space is shadow the ticker is shadow this is genesis go this is the centralized file storage the reason i like it the most is it has the best tokenomics and it's providing decentralized file storage in a faster cheaper better way than filecoin for example which does the same thing but the market cap is much much lower and it's pretty much almost fully in circulation so the tokenomics are great the market cap discrepancy between that and the comp big competitors is massive and it's offering a better product. I also like render, I don't have any render yet. Hive Mapper, like I said, I have a bit of Hive Mapper, but the tokenomics aren't great, so I haven't made it a huge position. But the one I'm really watching out for is Ionet. And this is probably going to launch within the next few months. It's pre-token, there's no, no way to invest in it just yet, but it is absolutely one to keep on your radar. It's going to be working with Filecoin and Render, but yeah, Ionet is definitely, definitely one to keep your eye on when it does launch. All right, so hope you enjoyed the overview on the deep in space. Definitely one of the most interesting and value additive niches in the entire of the crypto sector, in my opinion. So thank you so, so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.